All right, why don't we get started? Um, so I'd like to welcome everybody that's that signed in to our first pairs meeting of the year. Um, most of you probably know the members of the board, but I'd like to introduce everybody. Um, my name is Joe Panero. I'm the uh, acting president for the year. Stephen Hunt, who has been gracious enough to do the first uh, webinar, uh, is vice president, and we're welcoming Allison Tan, who is treasurer. The uh, format's obviously going to be a little bit different this year um, uh, with you know everything that's going on in, in, you know in society. Uh, we're going to do one meeting a month uh, through um, I believe it's through through uh, April or May. Uh, we're doing seven meetings. Uh, we have a lecture topic, so I I'm uh, thankful for everybody that responded to the survey monkey that Allison sent out. We use that as a guide to uh, give the topics, we wanted to choose things that people were interested in and, and would want to tune in for. Um, so um, tonight, which I'll introduce in a little bit, is, is lung ablation, but just so everybody knows what the topics are for the year, um, renal ablation, percutaneous AV fistula creation, geniculate artery embolization, advanced venous interventions, um, prostate artery embolization, PE intervention, and then we're gonna end the year with a case competition. So. Um, for those of you that have been to prior pairs meetings, you know that we end each meeting with three or four cases presented by med students, residents, and fellows. We're going to save all that for the end of the year and have that in one meeting. Um, the, uh, some of the other things that we're doing this year, we're going to suspend the physician dues. So we're not going to be asking you for, for, uh, to pay your dues each week or each, I'm sorry, each month. Um, we're going to suspend that for the year. Um, and um, I, I guess that's the, that's the main difference. Um, I would like to thank our sponsors um, for the year uh, as well, and we'll go into that with, with each meeting in particular. Um, as far as for this meeting, so again, Stephen's been, been gracious enough, enough to do the first um, webinar. Um, he's talking on a, or speaking on a topic that has my interest for sure. Uh, lung ablation has been a, an area that's been difficult to begin at Temple. And, um, I know he's had success at Penn, and I'm, I'm interested to hear uh, kind of what he's been able to do to get that service off the ground. Um, so without further ado, Stephen, I'm going to hand the floor over to you. Um, I'm going to make you the host right now, so you should have control of everything. All right, so I should be able to share the screen now. You guys can um, let me know if uh, you can see my screen. You see my screen there? Allison, just give me a thumbs up. Yep, we can see it. All right, great. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you all for uh, for indulging me as being the <laughs> the first speaker of the year. We wanted to really work out this uh, this new format, and uh, but it, but excited because I think that we can get um, you know a lot more participation as well in this virtual format. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, you know basically my my major practice, which is in lung ablation. Um, and in uh, a lot of the downstream uh, clinical activity that comes from uh, being part of the lung tumor boards um, at, the, uh, at the Hospital University of Pennsylvania, as well as over at the uh, VA. And um, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm also one of the co-directors of the big uh, IR research lab there, the Penn Image Guided Interventions Lab, the Piggy Lab. Um, and Thanks a lot. So today we're going to talk about lung cancer. I'm going to talk about demographics and why lung cancer should be part of your practice. I'm going to be talking about current treatment paradigms as they relate to the NCCN guidelines. Um, what's the role of interventional oncologists in helping to manage um, pulmonary tumors? Uh, the evidence base for interventional oncology um, in particular as it relates to uh, the lung. Uh, and then some tips on treatment planning and just show a couple cases um, at the end, you know, we don't have a lot of time, so uh, can't go too extensive, but, um, you know, we can set up another uh, case uh, presentation another time, but let's talk about it. So lung is by far uh, the number one uh, cancer killer in the world, as well as here in the United States. Uh, you can see the trends in age-adjusted cancer death rates. Um, basically, I just like to keep the numbers fairly simple. About 150,000 people die of lung cancer every year in the United States. The next one after that is colorectal cancer. Um, and you'll see once you start building a lung ablation practice that probably your number one actual case for lung ablation is gonna be colorectal cancer metastases. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit. 
so that's about 50,000. After that, uh, because colorectal cancer obviously affects both men and women, after that is breast at 40,000 deaths and then prostate at 30,000 deaths. So those are the big top four uh, cancer killers. Everything else is, is far below that. You think about liver cancer, it's less than 20,000. Um, but if you add up colorectal breast and prostate combined, you know, 50 plus 40 uh, plus 30, you know, 120,000 uh, cancer deaths, that still doesn't uh, equal just what you get from lung alone, which is about 150 to 160,000 deaths a year. Most of lung cancer is smoking related. Um, but also it also comes from environmental factors like here in Pennsylvania, radon, uh, as well as just um, bad luck with the genetics. Uh, and most of it is uh, non-small cell lung cancer. So small cell lung cancer um, is, uh, is neuroendocrine kind of lung cancer, and that's represents about 15% of the lung cancers. Um, and then you can split it from there into different forms like squamous cell carcinoma, uh, large cell carcinomas and adenocarcinomas. And you can see that adenocarcinoma makes up uh, the very large uh, bulk of disease. Um, we'll talk about how small cell differs from non-small cell lung cancer and where you might end up in the treatment paradigm for small cell. Um, but, uh, but just recognize you're kind of making the big split there. The other reason why this is becoming such a, um, and why it really struck home to me was during residency, uh, I was you know, following with interest the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial, which obviously our University of Pennsylvania participated in. Um, and this was uh, the first big screening trial in radiology in a while. Um, and this was basically looking at uh, low-dose CT and they compared it against chest radiography to see whether or not you could get a survival benefit from screening patients who are at high risk of getting lung cancer. These are basically people who have um, more than a 30 pack year history of smoking. Um, and so what they, what they showed was a, just to sort of summarize what that trial showed and was published in NEGM, they showed a 20% reduction in lung cancer mortality with low-dose CT. Um, and it was a 6.7% reduction in all-cause mortality by doing this low-dose CT in patients who are at high risk of getting lung cancer. But what was also shown was that you're going to end up with somewhere in the, you know, 20 to 30% overdiagnosis rate, meaning these are folks who will be diagnosed with lung cancer, will indeed have lung cancer, um, but probably would have uh, died from other causes. Um, and so what that means is we're really on the cusp of a similar situation to what the breast surgeons were in in the late 1970s with screening mammography. So as screening mammography propagated through the 70s and then became a you know, dominant paradigm, uh, they started seeing more and more patients with earlier stage disease and uh, mastectomy at the time was the only treatment. So because of that, and because they're seeing earlier stage disease and the morbidity and mortality associated with that major surgery, um, they started moving towards less invasive uh, means of managing breast cancer, and that was lumpectomy um, and, uh, and the various things that flowed from that. And so I think we're standing at that same cusp here with uh, low-dose screening trials in lung cancer. We're gonna be diagnosing a lot of early stage disease. And then the question becomes, how do we manage it? So it becomes a very topical uh, uh, topic of interest. So current treatment paradigms. Um, most institutions, if you're in private practice in particular, um, and, and not at a big academic center that maybe has a lot of clinical trials going on, are gonna be following what's called the um, NCCN, uh, treatment guidelines. And this is, uh, I've just pulled this up uh, for small cell lung cancer. Um, and you can see that small cell is essentially uh, separated into two stages. Limited stage, which means you only have essentially one tumor and maybe some regional lymph nodes, uh, and then extensive stage. And this was based on the surgical literature for resection. So if you had a limited stage disease, you could hope to get out the primary tumor as well as do a lymphadenectomy of all of the regional lymph nodes and hopefully remove all the cancer in that way. Um, usually, though, they would, they would how, how you can see this training, how this paradigm goes, pathologically mediastinal staining negative cancer uh, patients, um, you would try to uh, do a lobectomy, and then you would still do this extensive mediastinal lymph node dissection. However, what about for the patients who, uh, for some reason, cannot get surgery? Um, and so generally in the paradigm, as you can see, they're sent for systemic therapy um, and then often concurrent radiotherapy. But the issue is, is that A, patients are sometimes hesitant to get the chemotherapy. The chemotherapy is not that effective in small cell lung cancer. And very often they've been sent to see a surgeon at this point, and the surgeon tends to think in the setting of, 
you know, well, if we can get rid of the primary tumor, in particular if the lymph node staging has been negative, they would like to do that. And so they very often will send them, you may get referrals for these patients uh, and for that reason. All right, so now let's move on to non-small cell lung cancer, the bulk of, uh, of lung cancer. Um, and this is coming back to that idea of these subsolid nodules that I was talking about with the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial in these very early stage, you know, adenocarcinoma in situ uh, that are progressing on to a semi-solid component. So basically what you can see here is if you have a solitary part solid nodule and it's persistent and it develops a solid component that's greater than five millimeters, they recommend getting biopsy or surgical resection. However, as you can imagine, all of these folks are, um, because they're in the screening trials and because they have a heavy smoking history, many of them are uh, patients with advanced emphysema. They may have limited lung function. Um, they're considered at high risk for things like biopsy um, and high risk for surgical resection. They may not be able to tolerate losing that much real estate or that might push them over into uh, uh, you know, being on oxygen. And so because of that, um, you may get referrals from, you know, from the surgeons to instead do some minimally invasive way of doing a biopsy and ablation or just ablating it. Um, and in fact, my first uh, case uh, was from a surgeon and I'll talk about that um, in the setting of a you know, ground glass lesion that became solid. The other thing you see there is multiple subsolid nodules. You know, the problem with doing uh, a lobectomy in these patients is that very often another one pops up somewhere else or sometimes you're following folks and they have multiple of these ground glass lesions and maybe more than one of them is developing a solid component. Or they know that follow them long enough, if they do a lobectomy for the one that did develop a solid component, it's simply gonna be a problem down the road of when the next one develops a solid component. So because of that, you'll often get um, uh, asked to do something minimally invasive for those patients as well. So ablation could be an alternative for surgical resection for these pulmonary nodules. Um, then you have this, the idea of oligometastatic disease, and I'll get into what that means, but essentially, if you have patients with multiple lung cancers, um, metachronous disease, and there is a definitive local therapy possible, what I really want to point out here is that ablation is already in the NCCN guidelines. I think a lot of folks out there in private practice don't realize that when they're sitting at a lung tumor board, we are in the guidelines um, in, in the cases of patients who have uh, oligometastatic or multiple um, uh, metachronous uh, lesions. So they say, if you can do a surgery, do a surgery. Um, but again, many of these patients have comorbidities. You're looking at an elderly population, many of them with uh, advanced pulmonary disease. And so again, it may be that ablation provides a better treatment option for those patients. Multiple primary tumors. So this is again from the NCCN guidelines. Um, again, you can see that we appear, this is just literally taken from the NCCM website and pasted in here. You can see that ablation appears on that. So ablation can be an alternative to surgical resection for co-occurring tumors. Um, and then for recurrent tumors. So this is the guidelines for recurrent tumors of non-small cell lung cancer. And so they say if a definitive therapy for thoracic disease is feasible, um, you know, they go through these, you know, sizes, both the size of the lesion as well as nodal staging. Um, they say consider definitive local therapy for um, for the metastatic site if not already given. And so again, this is the setting of, of recurrence. And so back-to-back -back tumors where you have a recurrence, again, as they call them back-to-back, -back, so you've already treated one and now another one came on soon after. Um, then they say, if you can do more surgery, do more surgery. I mean, obviously that's the, the surgeons helping write the guidelines. But then again, uh, what's also uh, possible is that you can do uh, radiation or ablation. Another reason why interventionalists are so involved in this field is because um, really when you think about precision medicine and molecular testing of cancer for targeted therapies, the poster child of targeted therapies has been lung cancer, um, both because of the, um, uh, the genetic heterogeneity within lung cancer uh, and because there's been, uh, you know, obviously with, with a, it being the largest cancer market, there's been a lot of science directed towards that from industry. Um, and there's a number of mutations that uh, that predict or, or that, you know, are able to be targeted in the way that certain uh, drugs are used for it. So a lot of tyrosine kinase inhibitors depend upon whether or not you have a specific EGFR or epidermal growth factor receptor mutation. There's various drugs that target ALK mutations, ALK, um, which is another tyrosine kinase, uh, ROS. So there's a lot of these tests that are done now. And what that means is that the medical oncologists always need to get tissue so they can do that genetic testing. 
Um, and they can do that genetic testing in order to determine which form of targeted chemotherapy they're going to give or which form of whether the patient is a candidate for immunotherapy, which is relies on something called PD-1 and PD-L1 testing, which relates to the, the immunotherapy uh, immune microenvironment of the tumors. And so you can see that they basically get testing, then based on those testing results, you follow those uh, guidelines down. And if they have a specific EGFR mutation, they're gonna go down one pathway. If they have ALK mutations, they're gonna go down a different pathway, et cetera. And so all of these things um, mean that getting a biopsy is critical. And obviously every time you're gonna get a biopsy in a patient who has a lung cancer, there's an opportunity there to convert that, of course, into a biopsy and ablation. Um, because the, the medical oncologist would like to get that treatment tissue, but you have the opportunity as well, perhaps, to, um, to uh, get local control of the tumor. So what has been emerging really out of a lot of it, even in these early stage, this is um, uh, from a review on, on treatment of stage one non-small lung, uh, non cell lung cancer, is that in patients who have stage 1A or you know, smaller tumors um, uh, without uh, metastatic disease to the lymph nodes, if the patient can get a sur surgical resection, they basically go and get a sublobar resection if they can. Um, but if they can't, then you go down the pathway of perhaps they get referred to you or to uh, radiation oncology. Now, SBRT right now is definitely first line, um, but there's advantages and disadvantages. It's generally well tolerated, although you will, you know, you will often sometimes see radiation pneumonitis and things that can develop with that. Um, and it's oftentimes effective for local control, but patients often have treatment failure. And so you have uh, recurrence in the radiation portal. <coughs> Pardon me. And so you may get those patients as a second line therapy, um, or it may be that the tumors are, uh, that they have tumors that are both, you know, are, are multifocal and have central tumors as well as peripheral tumors. Um, and so in any case, you'll see that um, uh, ablation, and they're using RFA here, but any form of ablation, that ablation often serves as a second line uh, in those cases. Or in the larger tumor stage 1B, um, either they'll get a lobectomy or they'll get referred to SBRT, but again, you may, they may end up with those patients as second line or in combination with uh, SBRT for you treating some of the tumors, perhaps the peripheral tumors, while they treat the mediastinum. So what is the role of the interventional oncologist? Well, traditional oncology therapies that we know of, you know, surgical oncology, medical oncology, radiation oncology, right? Um, and we, of course, have developed our own versions of each of these in interventional oncology. One of the big, you know, problems with cancer is that it doesn't just stay in one spot. You know, you think about lung cancer, it can go to the brain, it can go to the bones, it can go to the adrenals, um, and, you know, the kidneys everywhere. And so I treat a lot of lung cancer that has gone elsewhere from the tumor board. Um, in addition, though, um, what has developed out of a lot of the literature on studying the metastatic uh, patients is that um, if you're able to do curative intent resection for these, uh, so oligometastatic resections, uh, they've demonstrated to have improved survival. Well, that has spilled over into other fields to say, if you can hope to get curative intent, um, perhaps you should be treating these uh, with local regional therapy. So. Uh, oligometastatic disease, this is this disease uh, concept that say, states that there's, you know, a limited amount of metastatic uh, disease for which you could hope to get a cure. And you're, you're, when you're looking at um, studies of this, of course, then you're going to be analyzing disease-free survival. So ablation has come into the role there, you know, kind of replacing uh, uh, surgery for treatment of these uh, sites of oligometastatic disease just like chemoembolization is our answer to chemotherapy and medical oncology and radioembolization uh, for radiation treatment uh, along with local placement of uh, radioactive beads. So what is the role of interventional oncologist at the tumor board? Obviously, number one is you have to be present at the tumor board. Um, and that's, that's step number one is that you have to participate in your tumor boards, whether it be the lung or whether it be the colorectal and the GI tumor boards in order to get referrals from those um, uh, from those uh, oncologists, you know, you have to be part of the discussion and you need to be educating them about what tools you have available to you uh, and the problems that you can solve for them. Whenever I'm looking at a tumor board, you know, I get on the list, they usually provide the patient list a day or two ahead of time. And I screen through and look at, you know, what is, what are the patients who are eligible for primary uh, treatment of primary disease in the lung or metastatic disease. Um, also just listening to what they're talking about in terms of their areas of frustration and need. Uh, when I think back to the first, the first tumor board I went to uh, 2014 um, as a young attending, 
uh, the, uh, the head thoracic surgeon was talking about how he just was not able to get chest tubes placed. You know, he said, oh, what are you sh you're showing up for my IR. That's the first time anybody showed up for my, my IR at this tumor board. And, you know, you guys can't even get chest tubes placed in my patients when I need them. So I told him, look, anytime you need a chest tube placed, just give me a call. Well, Fridays are my academic day generally when I see patients in clinic and stuff. And sure enough, that day, <laughs> he called me later that afternoon and say, hey, coming out of the OR, I have this patient, they dropped their lung. Um, you know, I can't get a hold of IR or whatever. And so I just put on scrubs and went and put in a chest tube. But the point is, is that you got to meet them where they need you. Um, and then uh, uh, because of that, um, the very following week, I had my first referral for lung ablation. Uh, know the current treatment paradigms. You know, everybody at that tumor board, the radiation oncologist, they know what's in the medical oncology literature. The medical oncologists obviously know the literature. And so you want to be part of that uh, knowledge base um, and be keeping up on the literature, both in interventional oncology, as well as in medical oncology and radiation oncology. Um, obviously getting involved in clinical trials, you're gonna get opportunities to be doing procedures as you're you know, helping your radiation oncology and medical oncology uh, colleagues out um, with their clinical trials. Um, palliative care, a lot of patients that I get out of lung tumor board are patients who are, you know, all of these lung cancer patients, uh, while well, a very large number of them will progress on to late stage disease, um, and they're going to need you for palliative procedures at some point. So being part of the palliative care team will also, uh, you know, uh, uh, end up building your practice. Um, be the available go-to person for crisis management, kind of as I've already mentioned, and then biopsy, 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 because every time you're putting a needle to a lesion in order to get tumor, um, you have the opportunity there to convert that into a treatment case as well. So I kind of think of this, uh, if you'll indulge me for uh, a little bit of fun, as a chessboard. You know, out front are the, the pawns, the thoracic radiologists. They're involved in diagnosing um, the uh, original nodule or lesion in the lung. And they're very often involved in that biopsy, sometimes not even from an oncologist, just the primary uh, doctor is saying, okay, well, lesion was found in the lung. Uh, now we're gonna send the patient for biopsy and that's very often going through thoracic radiology, but obviously out there in private practice, it's gonna be going through uh, whoever does the interventional procedures. Once that diagnosis is made, the patient, of course, is going to get it referred to medical oncology. And I call this the queen, the queen of the chessboard um, at the, at the um, uh, tumor board. And so they're, of course, involved in coordination of care, but they also have the poison apple. They're the queen with the poison apple for the, for the, uh, for the cancer, but they need to know what sort of poison do I poison the apple with, right? In this setting of targeted therapeutics, they need to know that genetic information about the tumor in order to make that informed decision. So they're coming to you to say, can you tell me what is the vulnerability of this person's cancer so I know what to dope the apple with? So this, they, they, I consider them kind of the queen of the board and they're coordinating the whole care of the patient. Uh, then the patient often goes to interventional pulmonology and these uh, folks, uh, you know, I consider them the rooks. They can only operate within the airways, but they're doing the heavy lifting of staging the patient. So they're going to be doing all the uh, mediastinal lymph node biopsying um, and getting cancer staging of the patients. Because while we can do transthoracic biopsies, we don't know, um, you know, what the lymph node station, um, which ones are positive. Obviously, PET gives us some information there. Um, but they, at, a, at an academic place like Penn or at most larger practices, the patient will end up going to interventional pulmonology for uh, lymph node staging. You then, of course, end up with the therapeutics. Now, the radiation oncologist, I, I liken them to the bishops. Um, they're able to, um, you know, kind of wave their hands and magically uh, treat the tumors. Um, just like, you know, uh, religion has its magical effects, uh, but just like religion, it also has uh, some serious drawbacks um, and, um, and there are serious side effects that are, you know, and limited in what they can do. Uh, the surgical oncologists are like the king. Uh, they cut it out, put it in a bucket. Um, they're involved generally in providing primarily therapy, but sometimes they get called in to do biopsies in patients that um, the interventional pulmonologist was not able to get a biopsy or thoracic radiology was not willing to do a biopsy in. So, um, so they're a king, but they're kind of the bloody king. Um, and so obviously there's a lot of morbidity associated with what they do at they do a thoracotomy and open up the chest. So, um, so they have, they obviously have a central role um, and second only really to the, to the queen, right? Um, but, um, but there's limitations there as well. So what are we? Of course, we're the knights. Um, we kind of sit in the middle here. We can do a lot of things. We can do the diagnosis uh, with the biopsies, right? We have that role. 
um, we can do palliative procedures like interventional pulmonology does. Um, and, uh, and so we kind of participate in that diagnostic as well as therapeutic um, axis. We also can do therapies like ablation, just like the you know, uh, surgeons or like the radiation oncologists. Um, and then of course we can treat outside of the lung. We have a lot of tools that we're able to use in other spots um, in the body where, where metastatic disease travels. Um, and then of course we, we interface with the medical oncologist because again, they wanna know, they want access to that tissue. And so we're kind of central to giving them that tissue. So you can see how we sort of sit in the center here uh, in, this, um, uh, in this chest port. So which patients may benefit? Really, I think that the number one uh, thing obviously is to know what kind of cancer are we talking about here? Is this metastatic disease to the lung or is this primary lung cancer? And then you're gonna separate it from there into is this, are we, are we talking about treating this tumor for palliative intent? Um, it's causing some symptoms, uh, perhaps it's causing bleeding in the airway or perhaps it's causing pain from local invasion or it's getting very close to a critical structure and or it's the only side of progression. So is this palliative, can, or are we trying to really get local control in an oligometastatic paradigm where we're trying to literally zap the tumors that are left um, while the patient stays on whatever targeted therapy, chemotherapy that they're on. So I think that it is important that as you track your practice and as you think about your practice, you know what is the purpose of this you know, particular treatment that you're doing. So what is the evidence base? And I'm just gonna cover some of the papers. I don't have all the literature updated here, I'm sorry, um, but, um, but kind of coming some of the highlights of some of the papers. So uh, radio frequency has been around the longest of all ablation modalities. It was developed in the 1990s. Um, and came into practice, you know, kind of before everybody else. And so it has the largest number of patients treated in things like lung ablation. Here's a paper looking at 566 patients, more than a thousand metastases. Um, what they saw was that the overall survival was very long, 62 months, um, one year local control rate, more than 80%. Um, and the efficacy rate, so the, the failure rate of, of, of local progression was only 11%. So a four year local efficacy rate was 89%. Um, and the lung disease control rate, because they allowed for, um, you know, treating multiple sites of disease was 44%. And when you really looked at the five-year overall survival rates, and this is, as you can see in the table below from the paper, um, and this is now nearly half a decade old, uh, all the different cancer types, um, the five-year overall survival rate of greater than 50% was comparable to the best results that are obtained by metastatectomy or surgical resection of uh, metastases. This was um, the eclipse trial was um, uh, the first and largest trial of cryoablation for lung metastases. And so this was a multi-center prospective control clinical trial. And they looked at um, 60 thoracic metastases treated during uh, 48 procedures and 40 patients. They had a very high local control rate, greater than 90%. Uh, overall survival rate was you know, almost universal at one year. Um, they only had 6% rate of CTCA uh, grade three adverse events and no grade four or grade five complications in their uh, trial. Um, what they saw was the patient's quality of life scores were unchanged. Now that may not sound like much, but that is very significant for, if you look at it compared to both radiation oncology trials as well as surgical trials, where very often there is decrements to the quality of life scores based on side effects. Um, and they also found that they had done PFTs on these patients pre and post and found there was no decrement in pulmonary function. So that's the, uh, the eclipse trial. Um, this is now looking at a mixture of non-small cell lung cancer and metastases. So again, the eclipse trial was looking at lung metastases, different types of cancer. Um, most papers though kind of mixed both primary and metastatic disease. And so it's difficult to parse out, you know, how do the lung cancer patients do compared to the other uh, cancer patients. And basically to summarize what a lot of the literature has shown is that rate of frequency ablation is generally well tolerated. It's definitely a lot cheaper than doing SBRT. You know, you can get things done in a one or two sessions versus you know, um, the, the number of sessions required for, uh, uh, for radiation. Um, and they have very high um, complete ablation rates. However, when they look at the outcomes reported generally in these series, they're often inferior to SBRT. There's never been a head-to-head -head trial of any form of ablation against SBRT. Um, but that is where the data stand. Um, this was uh, the first phase two trial of radiofrequency ablation for treating stage one. So those early stage non-small cell lung cancers, these were patients who were non-operable, right? Otherwise they would have gone and got an operation for, for their stage 1A disease. And what they showed was they had a very high local control rate. 
um, of 84%. The overall survival was very high at one year. The three-year local control rate of 81%, um, an overall survival of greater than, uh, you know, almost, almost two-thirds of the patients had, were surviving at three years. And so when you looked at that patient population, again, when you're comparing clinical trials and the results from uh, interventional oncology procedures versus SBRT or, or surgery, you need to consider your patient population. So these are our patients who have heavy comorbidities that allow them to not get surgery. And when you look at that patient population, the three-year overall survival rate is comparable to what you see in the SBRT literature for non-operable patients. This is uh, just another kind of retrospective, you know, looking at 47 tumors, uh, of which 22, 20, 25 were primary lung cancers and 22 were metastatic. And what they found was that the median time to local progression was actually much longer in the primary non-small cell lung cancer patients. And that's probably because obviously in those, in those patients, some of those were not metastatic perhaps at treatment time um, versus the uh, metastatic patients by definition, they were coming from somewhere else in the body. Um, and the median overall survival was, you know, uh, quite long in the um, non-small cell lung cancer patients. Um, and so again, this suggested that um, this, this therapy works both for the non-small cell lung cancer pa patient population as well as for the uh, heavily pretreated um, uh, metastatic patient population. What they also demonstrated, as many others after them demonstrated, was that tumor size greater than three centimeters uh, is associated with higher rates of local progression. Um, so obviously the larger uh, tumors have uh, um, a problem of treatment failure in the setting of incomplete ablation. This, I think, this set of papers, I very much recommend you having with you because I think it's very useful to show these Kaplan-Meier curves in your tumor boards. And so this was a large CR database study done by um, a colleague, Sharon, Sharon Kwan, out at University of Washington. And she did this very large study of, CR, of the, uh, the surveillance for epidemiology database looking at cancer in these stage 1A or 1B patients who are treated with either any form of thermal ablation, they all kind of get grouped together in that database, RFA, microwave, or cryo, um, versus those treated with sublobar resection. And what she found is that um, once you do your propensity score matching, there's no difference in overall survival or local cancer-specific survival in those patients. Um, they showed that ablation, she went on to show with an economics paper, uh, follow up that ablation requires significantly shorter median length of stay, um, which on average in the database was two days versus six days uh, for the surgery. Um, and then it had a significantly lower treatment related cost compared with surg uh, surgery. Um, but again, we've never studied this patient population head to head in surgery versus ablation. Microwave, the data is, uh, you know, more, is less mature because it's one of the newer modalities. Um, it's basically been shown to have similar results as radiofrequency ablation, significant savings in procedure duration. It's a lot faster, you know, with lung microwave, you could treat for, let's say, two minutes, um, and has a theoretical advantage in that it's less prone to heat sink effects. Um, but generally, the results that have been published thus far have been inferior to SBRT. Um, and again, they demonstrate, have demonstrated in the literature on microwave that uh, sub, you know, sub three centimeter tumors uh, have a better overall survival um, so if you're looking at them in blue is the uh, tumors that are larger than three centimeters. And you can see that drop off on the Kaplan-Meier curve of survival um, versus the ones that are um, under three centimeters, which have a, a more improved survival. So uh, that's just a little bit of the literature on evidence base. Now we're going to move on to treatment planning. So again, what patients may benefit, and you're going to separate that into, you know, you know, patients who have either metastatic disease to the lung or primary lung cancer. And are you going for oligometastatic paradigm where you're treating these in order to get curative intent? Or are you going for palliation? Um, so indications, palliation, you know, the patient has pain and you're trying to treat some symptom or they're having, you know, uh, hemoptysis or something, you're trying to treat that symptom. Um, or perhaps they have limited recurrence, as we noted in the NCCN guidelines, after surgery or radiation, they have some kind of recurrence. Perhaps they can't get additional radiation because they've already met their maximum uh, graze to the lung or to that area of the lung. Um, or uh, they've already, you know, the surgeon has already done a lobectomy on the patient. They don't want to go back and get a second tumor. Early stage patients who can't tolerate or they decline surgery or radiation, perhaps they've already gotten radiation pneumonitis uh, previously, um, or they have other comorbidities that allow them not to be a surgical candidate. So that's another reason why you might be uh, getting referrals. So you can see it can go from, you know, recurrent patients, early stage patients, intermediate stage patients now, 
These are, these are patients where I see the referrals from them is often from radiation oncology. These are patients who um, perhaps they have uh, a, a few nodes in the mediastinum or even bulky mediastinal disease, and the radiation oncologist would like to concentrate their dose uh, to the mediastinal and to the medial aspect of the lung, and you're gonna end up treating the peripheral tumors um, that you can ablate um, safely in the periphery, um, and that allows them to low, you know, to basically more uh, give more targeted radiation to uh, the medial aspect. Um, late stage patients, where they're under, they're on a, a targeted chemotherapy, they have systemic control, but then they get limited progression, um, what's called tumor escape, um, or uh, you know, probably and very often it ends up being due to that they've now acquired a mutation. So they have the acquired mutation tumors that have gotten escape somewhere in the body, whether it be in the lung, in the adrenal. Um, in the bone somewhere, but the rest of the disease is kind of quasi-stable or being controlled by the targeted agent, but then they're getting um, progression at, at limited sites. And then, of course, extrapulmonary metastatic disease. Um, so being present there, of course, you can offer them, you know, uh, transarterial embolization, whether it be chemo or radioembolization of the liver for liver metastases or ablation of METs to the adrenal or to the kidney. So I get a lot of that business as well. So contraindications, we talked about indications, contraindications, you know, if the patient has an uncorrectable coagulopathy. So these are kind of standard interventional radiology, interventional oncology contraindications. Um, obviously, if they have a performance status that suggests they're not gonna tolerate it or they can't get, um, uh, you know, any kind of anesthesia. Um, if there's no safe approach to doing the ablation. Uh, relative contraindication, tumor size greater than three centimeters, you have to have that frank discussion with patients that they're at high risk for recurrence. Um, once they get above three centimeters. And so it may require more than one treatment session, for example, or they may end up returning for, um, uh, for additional therapy. And then obviously, if they don't meet criteria for indications, if there's no pain, why are you doing a palliative procedure if, you're, if your thought is palliative intent? Um, or if they cannot reasonably expect local control, or if what's dominant is extrathoracic progression. So I call these my uh, treatment planning P's. Um, and so uh, maybe there's a stretch on some of them, but basically I usually will place the patient prone on the treatment side. That is treatment side down. Um, and so what that does is that both collapses the treatment lungs, so you have less chance of getting a pneumothorax, and it also allows for basically most of the motion of breathing to be done with uh, the, the, um, the lung that is not being treated. Um, and so generally the patient is lying on their side, uh, on the treatment side down, if that's possible, depending upon, of course, where the tumor is. Um, you would like to keep your probes parallel to the long axis of the tumor because, you know, even the probes that have a, a mostly circular ablation zone um, generally have a longer, uh, you know, it's, it's more of a longer than wide ablation zone. And so uh, that way you're lining along the length of the axis of the um, ablation probe. And then, of course, then I also keep them parallel to the pleura, which, which the whole point there is that you're trying to stay uh, away from poking towards the center structures, towards the heart, towards the uh, mediastinum, the hyla, uh, all that kind of stuff. Sometimes you can't meet all these criteria, but that is what you're trying to do. Um, and you're staying in the periphery, so that outer third zone of the lung, if possible, that's where you're gonna be safest. Now, sometimes you get asked to treat tumors that are closer to the mediastinum, and I think as you develop your practice and you get more comfortable with ablation uh, and more comfortable with managing complications, obviously, um, and, and you know, your risk tolerance goes up and you're able to treat more of those central tumors. Um, I recommend um, passive thaw uh, in the lung. You know, this is not something that, this is something that sort of differs from my practice in other sites and other soft tissue sites. Um, but generally I've had uh, a lot more problems with developing pneumothoraces and using active thaw uh, during, the, um, uh, during the treatment, uh, the triple cycle. At the end, I will use active thaw. If I have multiple probes in place, one by one, I'll turn on the active thaw and remove it um, for the, the final thaw. Um, but generally during the triple phase, I just use passive thaws, which is just kind of shutting it off. Obviously, you're trying to avoid critical structures like ves vessels. Try not to cross fissures because that's essentially akin to puncturing the pleura three times because wherever your initial entry was into the lung, and then if you cross uh, a fissure, you're gonna cross two more instances of pleura. So your chance of getting a pneumothorax has gone up, you know, 300%. Um, uh, if needed, you know, uh, I think a lot of people end up under treating these tumors, which is why we don't show, you know, 100% uh, local control rates. Um, and that's because they're, they're being a little bit too 
uh, generous with what they think the ablation zone is going to be. Um, so if needed, you know, bracket your lesions. You can even not, because uh, very oftentimes if you're dealing with, for example, colorectal metastases, many of these nodules are somewhat rubbery. And so it's hard to get the probe, uh, you know, every time you try to poke it, it kind of slides off your probe. Well, in that case, you can bracket it. Uh, and that allows you to get on either side of it and get a nice freeze. Um, and then my triple cycle that I use is basically five, five, 10, five, 10, five. So five minutes of freeze. This is the short freeze at the beginning is really just to get perilesional hemorrhaging. Um, and then I do two 10 minute soft tissue thaws, you know, freeze cycles like you would in, you know, the kidney or in other organs. So you have two long freezes which are really the, the crux of the, of the freezing. Um, and then one short freeze at the beginning just to, to sort of set up your ablation zone. Um, and this has been shown, triple freeze uh, cycle versus double freeze has been shown in many preclinical studies to, to uh, correlate with much better ablations. Number one question I get from people who are setting a practice, you know, uh, radio frequency or microwave heat based versus cryo. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a couple different drawbacks. I'm just talking about the, the, the drawbacks kind of in each modality. There's heat sink effects, um, obviously, in these heat based modalities. Um, number one, though, real problem is there's no real time monitoring of the ablation zone. You can't see what's being ablated. You can see it kind of after effects. You'll start to see the hemorrhage um, around the probe, uh, but it's very difficult to you know, to monitor what might be happening. And the other issue is, is that um, uh, the risk for thermal injury, it's, in, in my experience in microwave and in published experience, the problem with microwave is, is that, uh, as you can imagine, uh, from the tip back to the uh, kind of uh, where that microwave is being generated, um, these microwaves are being propagated out and they can have effects at far off distances um, in somewhat unpredictable ways. So, um, the only two, for example, really, uh, uh, the only two um, pulmonary uh, uh, pseudoaneurysms that I've gotten came in the setting of doing microwave ablation, uh, and they were not at the site of treatment. They were uh, at some distance where obviously the heat had damaged the vessel, not enough to cause coagulation, but enough to, to damage the wall that then later on developed pseudoaneurysm. So I think that that's, that's been my um, reticence at using microwave. Um, but obviously it gives you larger, uh, you know, treatment zones. And so I think for central tumors that are of a certain size, microwave is a consideration. Um, most of my practice, the vast majority is cryo. Um, now, theoretically, you have a higher risk of post-procedural bleeding. This has been shown at other sites. Um, and I think immediately in the setting of it, you know, it's not causing coagulation of blood vessels as much as the heat based thing. So I think you do have a higher risk of kind of immediate bleeding. Um, and the other issue is, is that it's smaller ablation zones uh, per probe, so you may require more probes than what you would use with a uh, microwave. Um, obviously, longer treatment times. This is usually with a triple cycle. You're going to end up like three, 30 minutes of treatment time. And then higher device use cost. Obviously, it has more to do with the fact that you might be using more, multiple probes. So that's, uh, that's my kind of statement there with the, uh, with the treatment planning and moving on to some cases. So again, when we talked about um, the various things that we could be treating for, we talked about treating metastatic disease. We talked about treating you know, palliation versus curative intent. Um, so I'm gonna give those two cases first on, on two cases of metastatic disease, one for palliation, one for curative intent. Uh, the next ones we'll go into are the primary lung cancers and, uh, and go through some of those examples. So um, one thing I'll say about uh, palliative intent, you know, when you're working with patients with pain, and I, and I have a very active uh, pain practice. Um, a lot of pancreatic cancer patients get referred to me for, you know, celiac plexus, uh, neurolysis, as well as just post-thoracotomy patients after, from the thoracic surgeons who have post-thoracotomy pain, um, who are coming to me for um, uh, neurolysis of their intercostals. You know, you always want to get a, a, as well as possible, a good history and just numeric scoring of their pain. So we all know this Wong Baker pain rating scale, it's basically zero to 10, zero, it doesn't hurt, 10, it hurts the worst that you've ever had in your life. Um, all usually at the time of clinic visit, have the patient start a diary right then, um, where once or twice a day they're checking in, maybe in the morning when they wake up, uh, because many patients wake up with pain. Uh, for some patients, it's when they go to bed at night that they mostly feel pain. So I'll have them at least you know, once or twice a day document their pain. Um, on a scale of one to tell, and keep that uh, from the time you see them in clinic um, till the time that you do your procedure. And then you're able to follow that uh, afterwards so you can really get a much better 
um, objective measure of, um, even though obviously it's a somewhat subjective thing that they're doing, but at least you can get a trend as to whether or not you're helping these patients. And you can alter your practice if you're finding that you're not getting you know, a, a good treatment practice or what things are working in your hands. So that's just a statement there. Here's a patient was coming to me, actually it was a radiation oncology referral. So this is a patient who had adenoid cystic carcinoma of the larynx, and they had multiple metastases in the lung um, and in the pleura. And you can see this metastatic disease back here at T6. It's basically starting to invade the adjacent rib and the uh, spine, and it was causing a lot of pain. They had radiated it multiple, multiple times, and he said he got no pain relief. Um, and so then the radiation oncologist, given that I'm present at tumor board and I'm always talking about ablation said, well, maybe ablation would work. Um, well, cryoablation is, uh, there's a very large and growing literature on cryoablation for uh, uh, neurolysis. It's a very effective neurolysis. Um, and given how close it is to the spine and things like that, I think cryo is a good option. So, um, you know, there's a there's preoperative CT demonstrating the 3.5 centimeter metastasis. So again, patient is present, you know, being a, um, uh, position with their treatment side down. What I love about cryo is, again, as you can see in this picture uh, over here, hopefully you can see my arrow, um, that as you do cryo, uh, you get that darkening effect on the CT where the density goes down as water content goes up. Um, and what that means is that you're able to actually see your ice ball as it envelops the tumor and as it gets close to any critical structures. You can see that I ended up placing two probes, both through the same uh, uh, intercostal space, um, into the tumor, one was oriented up, one was oriented down, um, you know, superior and inferior aspects of the tumor, um, and then cryoed it, uh, and uh, did a triple freeze cycle there, um, imaging kind of after each freeze and each thaw cycle, and then, you know, just, again, you can note the ice ball formation, and I actually included the pleura in this particular ablation in order to get that uh, area of pain. Um, you can see that, you know, you'll gradually see this is kind of how they look as they progress over time, You'll see cytal reduction as that area of ablation shrinks after cryoablation. Um, and uh, the patient reported instantaneous relief of his pain at that site. Um, and five months, you see the cytal reduction. And he continued when I saw him in clinic to have localized pain control. So this is just an example of a palliative one. Now let's move on to one where it's that oligometastatic par paradigm. And this is your colorectal cancer patients. So colorectal cancer, like we, we mentioned, it's the number two cancer killer. Um, kills about 50,000 Americans a year, um, and it very commonly goes to the lung. And what's interesting about it is very often you don't find those lung metastases until sometimes months or even years later, uh, because the patient has their primary tumor resected, they're on a period of um, adjuvant chemotherapy, um, but then they go off the adjuvant chemotherapy, and then eventually these lung nodules grow, um, and then they become aware of it. You know, we talked about the Eclipse trial, uh, for treating uh, uh, lung cancer metastases and those very good uh, overall survival rates. So here's a 60-year-old man, sigmoid can colon cancer, resected six years prior. And now he's showing up with these multiple pulmonary lesions, no visible evidence of disease on PET in anywhere else in the body. Um, and so it was the only known site of recurrence and he was referred to me by a medical oncologist. Um, so you've got four lesions total. One is a mass in the left lower lobe, uh, which you can see on the image there. Um, and then uh, one in the right lower lobe and a couple in the right middle lobe. So this is kind of early in my practice before I was following my own protocols for patient positioning of the patient, um, but trying to uh, cover all the lesions. <clears throat> one thing I want you to notice is kind of the eccentric localization of the probe here uh, in this one site, because uh, that'll come back to bite uh, me later. Um, so cryoablation of three right-sided masses in a single session there, um, intraoperatively, um, we, we target it um, and do our standard freeze cycles. And what happens is, you know, you're looking at the three months, you're kind of just looking at the ablation zone and each of those ablation zones essentially shrinks down over time. Um, and you can sort of see how they evolve over 22 months. But what happens at the one site um, is that uh, by 13 months, what had been scarring down as a linear thing now looks nodular. And then it, um, fast forward, uh, you know, almost a year after that. And what you see is that, um, they've got uh, uh, evidence of recurrence at that site. Now that patient also uh, unfortunately had systemic progression where his pet popped up with additional disease. So he went on to get uh, instead systemic chemotherapy um, rather than uh, just continue with lung ablation. 
All right, here's my actually index patient number one who I got from the thoracic surgeon. Um, this is a 75 year old man at the time um, who uh, had non small cell lung cancer and had a prior right middle lobectomy. Um, and then he had gotten a left wedge resection. So he actually ended up with two different uh, lung cancer surgeries. And this was the following week after, you know, my second week at tumor board. And, um, and I put that chest tube in for the surgeon. Um, so he was perhaps happy with me. Um, and, he, and he saw this thing and he said, oh, you know, I want to review it. This has been a thing I've been following for a few years and now it's gotten solid. It was just a ground glass nodule. It measures 1.2 centimeters. And it's got a solid component. Um, and uh, he said, do you think you, think you could biopsy this uh, and, and you, know, you could do your uh, ablation thing? And I said, sure. Um, and then the radiation oncologist popped up. Oh, no, no, we can radiate that for you, John. We don't need, really need to get a biopsy or whatever. And he's like, nah, give it to the kid. So, uh, so that was my first, my first patient. So again, um, looking at these subsolid nodules, you, you end up with this you know, treatment paradigm of biopsy or surgical resection. Um, but we stand at the ability to do a biopsy and ablation as an alternative. Um, again, looking at that SEER database study that showed that um, there was really no difference in overall survival or local cancer specific survival in these early stage lung cancer patients who were treated with sublobar resection versus uh, ablation. So we have a 1.2 centimeter ground glass opacity with solid component. Um, it's kind of small. It's in an anterior location, proximity to the pleura. You're probably not gonna be able to position this one treatment side down because of where it's at. And so this is gonna be standard supine positioning. Uh, what are the risks? You know, it's pretty peripheral. So, you know, there's always a risk of pneumothorax and bleeding. You would consent them for those things. Um, but, uh, but generally I'd say that this is a great starter uh, case because um, there's not a, not a lot that you can do wrong here. So what I did was placed a, um, a biopsy trocar into the, uh, uh, you know, into the anterior pleura, into the lung there. Um, and then through that trocar, it was actually a 15 gauge trocar. It had to size it up a little bit, um, but that way I could get these very thin, what I like about the glial system is they have these very, very thin 17 gauge um, treatment needles. And so you're able to get it into the, uh, right through a trocar. So I did the biopsy, then placed through that same trocar uh, the treatment needle pulled back the uh, trocar needle and did the freeze. Um, you could see what that ablation zone looked like at one month. Uh, the biopsy did come back as invasive adenocarcinoma, so it confirmed the pathology. Um, and you can see, uh, you know, six years later, you know, that was my first case. You know, the patient still has no evidence of recurrence. It's kind of scarred down. And this patient shows up once a year with screen his screening CTs and always brings me a lot of baked goods. Uh, um, and uh, and uh, has, has a pleasant visit, him and his wife, but he's very thankful that I saved him yet a third surgery. Um, and he always talks about, he always jokes with the surgeon about how different his experience was with his thoracotomies versus his ablation. So here's a patient, um, recurrent oligometastatic. So this is an example of my early experience with radiation oncology. So 73 year old man, history of right-sided uh, tumor, um, stage 2B non-small cell lung cancer, squamous cell uh, histology, he got bilobectomy in 2010, and then he got a right apical lung recurrence, which is treated with SBRT. Unfortunately, um, he got this recurrence along the suture line, um, and, uh, uh, and he also had evidence though of contralateral disease in the left lung. Um, but they, they wanted to go back and treat the left lung disease um, recurrence you can see some of the radiation change there. I'm not showing you the primary tumor on that side. Well, you can see what the PET was, where this thing was sitting um, on the right. So why would they send the patient to me? Well, what do you think is right next to there? You, you can't see it probably on your screens very well, but that of course is the goose. Um, so the esophagus, um, and then obviously other mediaspinal structures like the airway. So a tough spot. Again, this is the, the example in the NCCN guidelines where ablation can be an alternative to surgical resection for co-occurring tumors. You know, this is a patient both recurrence and co-occurring tumors, so he meets both criteria. <coughs> so on the PET, an enlarging posterior mediastinal paraspinal FDG avid mass along the resection margin despite radiation. Um, note the close proximity to the esophagus and the trachea. So what is the approach gonna be? You know, we're gonna have to obviously approach this patient uh, from the posterior aspect. What are the complications? Obviously, you could end up with um, direct puncture of the esophagus or, or fistulas and things like that. And so, um, and then what kind of outcomes are we going for? This is not a palliative treatment. We're trying to go for curative intent of this thing. 
Um, so uh, pa the patient was placed in a prone position. I actually put in a uh, chiba needle um, along the medial aspect of the pleura and injected a bunch of fluid to separate the uh, pleura and the, and the tumor away from, as much as possible, from the um, adjacent nerve roots, uh, as well as from the, you know, from the spine, from the esophagus, um, and then also from the airway. So I kind of instilled some fluid. And then I placed the needles, not into the lesion, but just kind of bracketing it above and below. And then I did a standard triple uh, cycle. Um, so there's my, you can see the little peeking through the little uh, Chiba needle there that I was using for the infusion. Um, and what you can see at 15 months is um, that we've, you know, there's no pet FTG activity. And in fact, that area scarred down. That's what that ablation zone looked like at one month. And then at 15 months, it has shrunk quite a bit. And there's no FTG avidity. Um, they had persistent viable disease at the site in which they were getting radiation therapy in the left lung. You can see 15 months later, still FTG avid. Um, and then this is just interesting the reason why I bring it up is the patient died 17 months after I treated him um, due to cardiac toxicity from his chemotherapy. So every therapy that we do, you know, as oncologists obviously has uh, potential to have uh, bad effects, including chemotherapy. All right, let's move on to the last case here, um, recurrent disease, another radiation oncology referral, this time on the other side, uh, but next to the uh, aorta. So this was a stage 1B patient who had non-small cell lung cancer, had chemo radiation, was not a surgical candidate, um, but they had recurrence in this periodic treatment zone. Um, you know, again, radiation oncology was reticent about treating that close to the aorta. They were worried about causing uh, necrosis of the aortic wall. Also, they had already treated in that area. So for a lot of reasons, they, they said, I know this is a crazy one, but do you think you can treat that? So pre-ablation PET CT demonstrating a 1.7 centimeter FTG avid mass, um, uh, periaortic. Um, they have, you know, the mass is sitting right up against the aorta and the pleura and the spine. So, you know, what kind of outcomes are we expecting? Well, we're trying to treat this for curative intent. What are the possible complications? Well, you could stick a probe into the aorta. Um, obviously, uh, that would be the, the, that's the worst thing you worry about. Um, so how did I approach this lesion? So they also wanted a biopsy, by the way. So um, I did something I call biopsy and artificial pneumothorax assisted cryoablation. So what I did was um, put the first probe in superior to the lesion, kind of alongside of it, right close to the aorta and stick it in position. You can, there's a stick function um, in the glial system that allows you to freeze, but just down to, you know, like negative uh, 50 or so and not all the way down to the negative 160 or whatever. Now you have the lung kind of stuck there, went in and did the biopsy along the actual uh, margin, you know, the ablation uh, zone where you'd like to go into the main meat of the tumor. So did the biopsy, pulled back the trocar, um, and then allowed pneumothorax to develop kind of in that pleural space. Now what you're able to do is take and lift the lung using that stick function that you have on the, on the tumor, lift it away from the aorta and stick your second probe in, and then do all of your cycles of treatment that way. Um, and so then uh, did your standard triple cycle. Um, and then at the end of the case, uh, you know, through, the, uh, through that trocar you have in place, put a wire and drop a chest tube, reinflate the lung. Um, and then the patient, uh, you, know, you know, you basically immediately after you, you reinflate the lung, you clamp the tube and you keep the patient for two hours. If it stays up, you're able to then of course remove the tube or perhaps you keep them overnight uh, depending upon your protocol. Um, so at, uh, at two months it, already, there was no evidence of FTG activity. And then over 30 months of following this patient, it developed a scar at that site, um, but no evidence of recurrence. Um, and uh, for, for this case, I think I got, uh, that's when uh, quite a number of the radiation oncologists started sending me patients because they thought if we can do this, we can probably do most of anything. So that's just uh, another fun case there. Um, but, you know, you know, yesterday I treated, um, three patients with lung cancer. One of them was a lung, you know, a standard lung ablation. It was a, um, uh, sorry, one of them was a, a colorectal cancer metastasis to the lung. Uh, one of them was a lung cancer that was in the liver. And so they had taste and, and pre-Y90. Um, and then the other one uh, was an adrenal um, occurrence of lung cancer metastasis to the adrenal. So I just, I just mentioned that because the vast majority, perhaps, you know, in, like in my practice, 80% of what comes out of the lung tumor board is not going to be lung tumor ablations. It's going to be all the other sites that, 
um, it goes to. So adrenal, I do quite a number of adrenal uh, ablations, biopsies, um, periodic node metastases where there's just one spot popping up on PET and they're like, can you just biopsy that and freeze it? They wanna know whether they got clonal escape and at the same time, they'd like to just get local control. Um, I do a lot of palliative cryoablation of, of uh, tumors in the bone or in the soft tissues that are causing pain. Um, so there's an example of one that I did in the pelvis, um, you know, in the buttock, um, obviously liver metastases, renal metastases. So the point being that, you know, lung goes everywhere. Uh, and if you're present at the tumor board, you can offer your services in oligometastatic uh, paradigm uh, or for treating for palliative intent. So in conclusions, why interventional oncology? You know, we offer minimally invasive interprocedural, you know, they have minimal interprocedural pain and blood loss and these short hospital stays, low morbidity, short recovery times. You can provide those biopsies and that tissue sampling that the medical oncologists are, are very keen to get. Um, you know, if you're using uh, cryo, you can have this radiographic visibility, allow you to very precisely target your treatment zones. Um, excellent safety profile, it can be used to treat tumors that are recurrent, it can be used to treat tumors that are not suitable for resection or radiation, it can be used to treat a range of tumor sizes, it can be used to treat central tumors, it can be used to be tumors in multiple body sites, so all of that extra thoracic disease, and then of course it can be used for palliative procedures. Uh, so I'll just leave this up for one minute, the relevant literature, um, and uh, hopefully you can get that and then there's just uh, my contact information as well as you know I encourage you to visit our website phillyir.org and sign up for our email list if you want to be on this and get you know notifications about future uh, content coming from us hopefully this uh, when COVID blows over we can have a big uh, uh, Paris party uh, and do more socializing uh, like we used to um, but uh, but look forward to you know uh, Allison has uh, arranged for a great uh, series of speakers and, and content uh, with your all's input and to what you guys wanted to hear. Um, so sign up there and uh, follow our new Twitter account uh, at Philly Angio. And with that, I'll take any questions and turn the speaker back over to uh, Joe. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm here, man. Very good talk. Um, I'm gonna go through the questions and I'll, I'll let you respond. Um, sure. The, uh, the first one you, you did touch on a little bit in, the, in the, the, the talk as far as cryo versus, versus heat. I know there's some people that will not use heat if it's within a centimeter of the pleura uh, due to pneumothorax rates. Uh, what's your approach? Are there things where you would never do cryo um, and vice versa? So for the most part, I would say definitely anything that's juxtapleural um, you would not want to use a heat-based approach because essentially wherever you heat, you form a tract that's like a burned, um, you know, coal, coal uh, straw. So you don't want to have cross the pleura with heat uh, because you'll get a bronchopleural fistula that won't heal. Um, and even ones that are central, you know, the only bronchopleural fistulas I've gotten have unfortunately been with microwave even in central tumors. So that is, I think, a much bigger problem with heat-based therapies is things like bronchopleural fistulas. The other issue is, is that again, because of the uh, predilection towards um, propagation of RFA and, and, uh, and microwave energy, um, I always worry about treating too central of tumors with those technologies. That said, I have seen um, Damien Dupuis uh, talks and he has treated many things with microwave. He just has simply more experience and he knows what he can get away with and what he can't. Um, but ten, I tend to use cryo uh, much more for those reasons. Um, I've used microwave for recurrent tumors, um, but I've also gotten, uh, unfortunately, uh, bronchopleural fistulas in that setting, um, but used microwave when tumors came back because of the fact that I was worried the cryo just hadn't provided, you know, uh, uh, the full treatment. Um, but I would say that the majority of my lung ablation practice is with cryo. The only time I'd use microwaves for large tumors where I was just thinking that it's, it's going to, you know, cut down significantly the number of probes. Okay, great. Um, the next question is uh, regarding the future of lung ablation in the IR setting. Um, it's regarding uh, Florida specifically. Um, this uh, person has had issues getting programs started. Uh, part of that is cryo has had issues getting reimbursement. Um, are there any studies coming out that will support the use of this in IR? Any disruptors? Have you had any reimbursement issues? So, you know, I, I 
don't know exactly about all the reimbursement things. I do know that there's dedicated CPT codes and that has already been through the RUC. So it's no longer like in um, one of these more miscellaneous codes. There's a dedicated uh, pulmonary cryoablation code. Um, I think that it, uh, my understanding is it reimburses at or better than uh, RFA and uh, microwave. So I've never, you know, I haven't really had an issue with the reimbursements and I haven't had um, uh, from my NPs uh, who do that, uh, you know, calling for the pre-search and stuff like that. I haven't had uh, a lot of issues with it. So I think that, um, you know, obviously you're going to have to educate your, uh, your referral base and stuff like that. But, uh, but there are dedicated uh, CPT codes for this procedure. Um, okay. Um, regarding uh, how do you manage uh, pain involved involved with freezing of the chest wall? So cryo itself is a, is a very effective uh, uh, tool for, for uh, neurolysis. And so, in fact, many people do intercostal neurolysis by simply placing a cryoprobe alongside, you know, kind of in parallel with the rib. Um, right underneath the rib and then freezing there. So, um, so I don't find uh, that cryo uh, ends up resulting in a lot of pain. In fact, I do a lot of palliative cryoablation of, you know, chest uh, lung masses that are growing or pleural masses that are growing into the chest wall because it provides significant pain relief. So the same for, you know, metastases to the bone and things like that. I think cryo is pretty effective for pain relief. I do do um, uh, I do do intercostal nerve blocks. Um, in many of my patients, um, uh, mostly so that, you know, particularly if they're wanting to go home that day, uh, I worry that their, you know, pain control regimen might wear off and things like that. Um, so for that, of course, you just go underneath the rib with your little 22 gauge, you know, lido needle. Um, and uh, typically I inject uh, two mLs of bupivacaine um, into that uh, space underneath the rib. Um, you can use a little contrast if you're just getting used to it to see the nerve uh, being. Um, uh, outlined, um, but that's quite effective. For more permanent neurolysis, you can always use uh, two mLs of ethanol after you've done your bupivacaine block, but you've got to leave that bupivacaine in there for about uh, 10 to 15 minutes to really get a good nerve block before you do the alcohol, otherwise they're going to jump off the table. It's, it's quite painful to do ethanol neurolysis um, without having first blocked that nerve. Um, okay, are you, I know uh, there are people that are doing both general anesthesia and uh, conscious sedation. Are you, which are you doing in your practice? So I started off mostly doing conscious sedation, um, but what it developed at our institution was we had more and more availability of anesthesia. Um, and then I had patients who had had both. And so I was able to kind of do my own, uh, not randomized, but my own kind of clinical trial. Um, and most patients, uh, prefer general anesthesia. Um, sometimes I still will ask a patient, but e even when I say general anesthesia, very often the anesthesiologist asks me, and if I'm doing cryo, um, you know, I just say, you can do whatever, whatever the anesthesiologist, you know, given the positioning, whatever they feel comfortable with. And so I would say the vast majority of them just get conscious sedation, but provided by anesthesia. So either propofol, um, or something like that, where they don't intubate the patient, or in any way they might put a nasal trumpet in or something, but um, but they don't uh, they don't even do a laryngeal mask airway. They just uh, sedate the patient, but have anesthesia controlled. I know that that makes my nursing staff also happier. So it somewhat depends upon your um, the proficiency of your nursing staff on managing this. At the VA, anesthesia is still a real issue getting anesthesia coverage. So all of those ones I still do under uh, just conscious sedation. Um, but the vets are also a hardier lot and they, um, you know, they tolerate it. Um, so I guess, yeah, that's, that's the vast majority of it. I think that when it comes to one of the big questions that I get is between, you know, intubation or uh, non-intubation. Um, one thing I will say is that I have found that with intubation, probably because of the positive pressure, um, the pneumothorax rate goes up a little bit. Uh, and so if you're able to get away with the anesthesiologist doing uh, conscious sedation, you know, you can always convert to intubation if necessary. Um, you'll probably get less of a problem because of the positive pressure ventilation um, when you do, you know, non-intubation. Okay, great. Um, and then uh, as far as, so if, if you're in a tumor board and uh, you and the radiation oncologist both want to offer treatment for a particular uh, lesion, 
how is it decided who treats the patient? Is it is that a battle you're always losing or or how does it go? So I would say at the beginning it was yeah. I mean, first of all, they have um, they have the randomized controlled clinical trials showing that they're efficacious, not against us, but just you know against whatever uh, non radiation therapies are. Um, so I think that the the data is kind of on their side. But uh, one of the things to understand is that again, where we win is that if the oncologist wants additional tissue, then you're able to offer them and biopsy ablate paradigm um, and without uh, any significant additional, generally without any significant additional risk because, um, you know, actually I, I find that biopsying alone, um, you know, you're not able to control the hemorrhage. Um, you know, if you get a pneumo, you're gonna have to put a chest tube in the same. Um, so um, I actually think that, uh, and when I put, when I do biopsies and ablating, generally I put an ablation probe in and stick the tumor before I do the biopsy. Um, and that in some ways I think stabilizes the lung um, for the biopsy. Uh, and given that you're gonna have to come out with your, you know, do multiple passes, I do, I do all core biopsies as well. Um, so if they want a significant amount of tissue to send it for fish and to send it for all these kind of things that they want, I think that then the medical oncologists drive it that way. It's also, like I said, somewhat about just making those connections with the surgeon. It was, you know, I had put in a chest tube and uh, that was his area of need. Um, and so then he started sending me patients. And then from that grew the practice. Um, I think being able to offer uh, treatment outside of the lung and in different spots, hard to go spots is another thing that drives your practice. Um, but I have patients that um, have come to me, they come to radiation oncology. Um, and, uh, and in the end, um, I think that if it was just between the two of us, radiation oncology would probably win. But very often now I have patients where radiation oncology is saying, listen, I'm gonna treat these lesions, for example, I'm gonna clear out the, I'm gonna put my radiation portal in the right lower lobe. Why don't you treat this one lesion up in the left upper lobe and that way they don't have to get uh, you know, additional radiation in a different spot or they don't have to come back later. Or you think about the squamous cell cancer patients, for example, head and neck cancer patients. They often wanna radiate the primary tumor up in the neck and they say, well, we can wait around and then radiate the lung later or they'll send them to you and you can do the ablation while they're concurrently, while they're getting the radiation treatments in their neck. So I think it's about developing that collaboration. At the beginning, it's gonna to be tough, but then you're gonna start getting those referrals as well from radiation oncology. Um, and then I just had uh, one or two quick questions. Um, who is your biggest referral? Is it actually failures from radiation oncology? Is it surgeons? Is it medical oncologists? Um, and has it changed over time? And meaning, were you initially just treating the maybe failures of rad onc, and then it kind of blossomed from there? Or, or how, did, how did it kind of shape up? Yeah, so I think that, um, you know, number one, like I said, the first case was a surgeon. The next case was a medical oncologist. Um, and in terms of, if I just talked about pulmonary ablations, uh, like I said, pulmonary ablations actually, the majority of those come from one of our colorectal oncologists because majority of those are colorectal mets. Um, I still do treat a lot of lung cancer, um, uh, you know, recurrences and things like that in the lung, but very often it's the cases you mentioned. Um, and so what comes out of the lung tumor board is a lot of adrenal biopsy and ablations, a lot of uh, liver, uh, you know, uh, biopsy and chemoembolization or radioembolization, um, a lot of bone uh, procedures, you know, ablation and cementoplasty, things like that. So a lot of it is the non-lung, but lung cancer that has gone to other sites that comes out, uh, a lot of what comes out of the lung tumor board. Um, but sometimes, you know, you start off with doing that and then something recurs in the lung and the patient's like, well, I've already had you before. I would like to stick with you also if you're able to treat the lung. So you kind of end up with this reverse thing where you treated first extra thoracic disease and then they had a recurrence within the lung and you end up following up with that. So uh, most of, I would say again, the number one uh, lung ablation um, is the colorectal cancer metastases and then things like um, in concert with radiation oncology for uh, multimodal treatment or for recurrences after surgery and radiation um, or for patients who want to get a biopsy uh, uh, with a medical oncologist and they'll say biopsy and ablate. Okay, and then the last question I had, are you doing um, CT fluoro or are you basically just kind of advancing and stepping out of the room, particularly I'm thinking of that lesion that was right by the aorta, 
which uh, I, I can see once you can kind of close to that, it could get a little iffy. So I didn't know if you were using CT fluoro or not. I, I do use it. I do use it selectively. Um, I do use CT fluoro selectively. Um, but I just found, you know, I, I guess I'm not as uh, proficient with it. It, took, it, it. it takes me longer. And sometimes you're coming at angles where, as you know, you kind of have only limited slice positions. And so when you're coming out of plane, unless you have a, um, a gantry that can angle, uh, that makes the CT fluoro, you know, not as useful. Also, uh, perhaps this is somewhat of a uh, uh, inside thing on to IR, but the fact that I don't have to wear lead for these cases is a, is a welcome relief in my day <laughs> um, from wearing lead in all my other IR cases. So, uh, so that's another reason why perhaps I use less CT fluoro than I should. Okay. Um... Again, that was a great talk. I really appreciate uh, you giving it to all of us. Um, if anybody has any uh, quick questions, feel free to, to type them in. Uh, just as the last point, I just want to let everybody know that, uh, again, we're going to be doing one of these each month. The next one is going to be in the middle of November. Uh, we'll send out some emails as to when that exact date and time will be. Um, and in that one, actually, our first two talks this year are going to be ablation, so that's going to be on renal ablation. Um, but if there's no other questions, I think we'll end it there. And again, thanks very much, Stephen. Thank you so much, and thanks everybody who tuned in. Thank you.